a lot of Christians in America have a, a form of Christianity that's very cerebral. I gotta, you know, give intellectual assent to various truths claim. And for some people that sort of is it. But if you were living with such a person and you're in your family and your relationship with them, how is that knowledge actually transforming their lives and helping them be more lovable and more loving? Are they actually embodying what they've given intellectual assent to? Are they actually allowing for feeling and emotion to show up in their life? Are they embracing and integrating feeling? Are they allowing that knowledge to be personal and experiential? And are you able to embody this knowledge you have of, of God and Jesus? So moving from the head to the heart and having a more embodied faith and these practices that the spiritual but not religious have can really be helpful whether it's yoga or a static dance or grounding earthing in nature there's there's so many possible things that can help us and and it makes me sad that there's a lot of christians who sort of say the right things believe the right things but there's more healing and integration and and more relatability that could show up as they interact with their family members to avail themselves to a wider range of, of healing practice. Welcome back to Practice Not Perfect, a podcast about practice that is rooted in the Christian spiritual tradition. I'm your host, James Matichuk. I am excited about today's conversation. I got to sit down with Roger Wolsey and discuss his book, Discovering Fire, and I think you are going to enjoy it, whether you come to us from the Christian tradition or from the spiritual but not religious segment of our population. There is a lot of ways that we practice spirituality, and Roger has written a wonderful book that explores these. Here is our conversation. Hello, everybody. I'm here with Roger Wolsey, who is a speaker, an author, a pastor, a blogger, well-known in the progressive Christian world. He was a fish kisser in the days before he discovered fire. That is, he wrote the book Kissing Fish, Christianity. It's a subtitle. I forgot. Yeah, Christianity for people who don't like Christianity. Okay, Christianity for people who don't like Christianity. And your new newer book is the Discovering Fire, Spiritual Practices That Transform Lives. And so we're here to talk about your new book and practices in general. You have a number of them in there. Uh, but be, when I begin a podcast, I always like to ask these practice questions. And you have like 31 practices in your book. So when I ask this, I'm not looking for any of those, but what is one thing you've practiced a lot of in your life? And when I say this, it doesn't have to be a mystical, spiritual practice in any way. It could be an instrument that you play, perhaps, or a sport that you were involved with or a hobby or anything that you've spent a lot of time practicing. Yeah, that's pretty easy to answer. Uh, trumpet. I have spent a lot of time practicing trumpet since I was about uh, 10 years, maybe nine years of age. Yeah, nine years old. Wow. And I was one of these people who didn't put it down at the end of high school. I, I kept playing in college and uh, through my life ever since. Um, and I've occasionally played in community bands, uh, frequently pull it out several times a year for church services to add you know, trumpet brass color to the various hymns. And I, of course, just did that recently for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And it's also something that I just enjoy. It actually can be a spiritual practice where I sort of have little recitals to the divine and uh, just enjoy making music. And uh, I often like doing it outdoors under bridges where there's really nice acoustics. When the weather's good. Oh, wow, that's neat. Yeah. Yeah, so I was a trumpet player as well, but I am someone who did put it down. And when you haven't played your trumpet in in a while, you pick it up. It is it is sad because you know more than you can do. Um, and my my I had a kid that was playing trumpet in in high school, and I I'd pick up her trumpet, and 
and I couldn't hit the notes that I that I, I knew I should be able to hit. I still remembered my muscle memory remembered all the fingerings, but not not the the lip strength was not there. Right, right. But that's my second question uh, for you. I know you didn't put trumpet down, but what is something that you have practiced a lot of, but you no longer practice? What is something you put down? Wow. Okay. Well, there's two things that come to mind. One is uh, rowing boats. I used to row boats on a crew team and uh, other way capacities. Mm-hmm. And another one is martial arts, uh, Tong Sudo and Taekwondo. And I've sort of retired both of those from my life uh, for different reasons. Um, the, the the rowing boats primarily because I don't I can't afford to own one of those rowing shells. They're very expensive. And unless you're part of a club or a team to have access to uh, community shared shells, it's not really easy to pull off. And then the martial arts, I I was working my way up in belt and rank, and in, in both in Tang Sudo and Taekwondo when they started teaching the various things about how to really disable people, um, breaking knees, and even killing people. I like you know I. That isn't quite <laughs> consistent with my values as a Christian. So uh, I'm okay, self-protection, but I don't really want to know how to kill people. Thank you. So that's, I stepped down from those two things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I guess I, when I was a kid, I did uh, karate, but I, I have not done or thought about it much in years. So that's, that's another point of connection. So <laughs> you're, your book is called Discovering Fire, Spiritual Practices That Transform Lives. So I, I'd like to start with a really basic question. What is fire? Yeah. So as I'm using the term, I, I'm pulling it from an essay by Teilhard de Chardin. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a r- rather famous quote where he talks about, and I don't have the book in front of me with the I, quote. I have, I have the quote, I think. Go uh, ahead and read it. Yeah, it's a lovely yeah. quote. Someday, after mastering the winds and the waves and the rides and the gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And then, for a second time in the history of the world, humanity will have discovered fire. Yeah. So, it's interesting that quote comes from an essay that he wrote called On Chastity. <laughs> and uh, the quote sort of lives beyond that essay. And uh, just like many things, has multiple meanings. In his context, he meant the, the, the passions of life that, that are beyond the sexual mm-hmm. uh, and in ways that are in sync with the spirit of God. And, you know, he and others have this notion that our Imago Dei image of God isn't our physicality. It isn't, you know, some guy in a beard with uh, in the sky with muscles or something. It's it's uh, our capacity to love and be loved and our capacity to create and be creative and contribute to the mm. larger whole. And that very much I resonate with. The first introduction, I believe it is, or maybe it's chapter one, I, I use that quote. And then right below it, I have a quote from a poem I wrote, which is sort of the opposite, where it, uh, it's from a poem called Blue Moon. And I talk about nothing but moon dust, nothing much at all, no fire in my belly to make me blow cat blow, uh, nothing much at all, uh, a desolate Alcatraz in the sky. So it's the opposite of, of having a sense of fire in your life. And um, the fires, as I use it, are practices both within the realm of organized religion and in the realm of the spiritual but not religious that enliven us, that bring back a sense of fire in our life, that help us to reclaim our Imago Dei, our capacity to love and be loved and to be have passion to be creative and offer uh, mm-hmm. our, our own little something into the world so uh, these fires are things that can in fact enliven us that they can transform us to help us to be more content with ourselves and interact better with others and add a little our special little something in the world that needs it yeah uh, oh, that's very neat. And yeah, I mean, like I said, you have like 31 different practices. And some of these will be pretty familiar for those who are rooted in the Christian tradition. 
And some of them, Roger, I don't know, you, they, they push the envelope just a little bit. Um, and you know that. And as I read through the book, I've, I'm familiar with experientially about half of them, um, you know, and some of them I've never, never done or, or imagined or have felt like were out of bounds for me as a Christian. So, because sure. you know, in the, in the faith tradition that I was raised. So this, the question I would have for you is who is this book for? Yeah, it's for two audiences, really, M- maybe three. So, but two within the church. Mm-hmm. So you've got you've got um, church leaders who are wondering where the heck are all the the people that are under forty in the church? You know, where, yeah. where are these people? What's going on? Why are they not here? Well, the book, in some respects, speaks to that and what they're doing instead of coming to church and how they're getting needs met outside of the church. Uh, and the church can figure out, well, do we want to meet them halfway? Do we bring in some of these things? Do we start offering yoga in our building? You know, choices that are made to mm-hmm. figure out what, what can we bring in? What can we feel good about offering? Uh, so that's one piece of it. Another piece is there's a lot of adults in the church who have kids or grandkids who are engaged in, in these alternative spiritual practices, tarot cards, astrology, uh, uh, maybe spending time in nature as church. And they even say that's their church. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or uh, a static dance. Um, and it could be things like plant medicine, uh, psilocybin, uh, what have you. And you wonder, there are some perhaps more conservative kind of parents that are wondering, well, are my grandkids going to hell? Um, they're not in church. And not only they're not in church, they're engaging in these things that I was taught are bad or yeah. uh, anti-Christian or something. And I, I pull from two people, uh, Madame Curie, who was a great uh, scientist in chemistry, known for her work with radioactivity, radium. Right. Yeah, And she, she has this famous uh, quote, which I'll paraphrase, that we uh, are afraid of things, and when we're afraid of things, we reject them. But what we need to do is learn about things so we aren't afraid of them. Yeah. And that I, I apply to this whole project. And also, uh, Reverend Fred Rogers, who we know as Mr. Rogers, right. had a really lovely saying, uh, and again, I'm going to paraphrase, that anything that can be said can be manageable. And when things are manageable, we can move forward in life. Mm-hmm. So yeah. That's, that's another uh, larger piece. So with these, t- that umbrella in mind, well, let's talk about some things so we aren't so afraid of them. Yeah. And as, as non-Christian, and then the other audience, of course, are the people who are non-Christian, uh, spiritual, but not religious. Mm-hmm. They're going to Burning Man. They're yeah. Uh, they're going to, uh, I don't know, ayahuasca journeys or psilocybin journeys. They're engaged in tarot cards or astrology. Um, they're going to a static dance. They're, they're doing a lot of things that doesn't seem like the church offers. And they, in their mind, are wondering if their grandparents are going to be in any way whole. Are, are they being taught a bunch of patriarchal stuff and misogynistic stuff and homophobic stuff. And like they, they fear for people in their lives who are part of the church many times. And are they going to grow up? Are they going to evolve? Are they going to integrate? And so both sides have assumed the worst sometimes about the other and aren't aware of actual life changing practices that are really actually making a difference in people's lives. And so I'm sort of a bridge between the two realms Yes, I'm an ordained pastor, and yes, I've experienced a lot of these practices, and they, in fact, have been part of my own healing journey and salvation. Sozo, of course, you know, it's, as a progressive Christian, I understand it more in the Jewish sense. It's not believing X, Y, and Z about Jesus so I can go to heaven when I die. That's kind of American Christianity's understanding of salvation, but more wholeness liberation, well-being in the here and now, that, mm-hmm. that is, in fact, part of salvation. And Jesus was a Jew. And when he yeah. was talking about salvation, uh, he's also talking about the Jewish perspective of it. So uh, I'm trying to remind us of that as well as part of uh, a, a gift, a, a reminder, a course correction to Christianity that 
hey, let's take salvation more seriously than we've been doing it. Yeah, well, and I would totally agree with that. Um, I, I, you know, I was raised evangelical, so I have vestiges of that, and sometimes feel like I have to apologize for my high Christology when I'm in progressive spaces. <laughs> but, um, but it, it's a bigger thing than cr- Christians have made it. And there was there was an evangelical author, um, Dallas Willard, hmm. that, that called you know the American gospel the the uh, the gospel of sin management, um, right? And and that that is not that is not the biblical sense of salvation, which has more of this liberative, real embodied life kind of way of of being in the world. So exactly, I, I, yep, yeah. yeah. And these practices are designed and offered to folks to help them experience that that greater sense of wholeness, healing, well being. Uh, that, that's exactly what they are. And Christianity, it's not like we don't have our own share of practices that are sure. transformative. And I, I, I begin by naming those and, and yeah. there's probably others that I didn't name, but I, I wanted to name some ones that I have felt uh, transformation with. And then I move into sort of the no man's land where it's sort of vague and both sides can sort of claim it, things like the Enneagram or yep. Yep. Uh, what have you. And then I move into the more spiritual but not religious things. Uh, and then it's chapter six is the longest chapter. It's the praying with plants, uh, yeah. sacred medicine, and psychedelics, what have you. That's probably going to be the reason most people from various audiences are going to end up buying the book. Like, what is he going to say here? Um, <laughs> but the zenith of the book really is chapter seven, which is um, poetry, reading and writing poetry as a spiritual practice, mm-hmm. which for me is the most transformative, at least in my life. Uh, yeah. So it, it's not like chapter six is the big climax. No, it's it's poetry, <laughs> um, at least in, as I describe it. Yeah, so, well, uh, I love that chapter, by the way. Uh, and I would say that's been something for me, too. Writing poems, not just about life experience, but sometimes that's how I inhabit the, the lectionary. Uh, I'm a lectionary preacher. And, yeah. it, and, you know, we just had Easter Sunday. Mm-hmm. And... I love the the man in the tomb that is dressed in in white, dazzling white, uh, and he's described as a young man. And two chapters earlier, there is a young man mm-hmm. that is that, that that runs away naked when he's seized at Jesus' arrest, and and it is the same language used as both. And for me, that's a poem. Yep. <laughs> um, and and. If you don't read the whole section, you don't get the, the literary appreciation of of that and the the kind of untethering that happens before the the crucifixion and the way things are put back together when somebody is showing up talking about resurrection. So I mean, I, I get it. It's 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 a it's a beautiful way to inhabit, and you have lots of poems that inhabit your life experiences and your faith experiences and uh, you're wrestling with relationships and different things. So I, I really loved that section a lot. I'm so glad that makes yeah. me happy. Yeah. Well, when I read your book, one of the things that I really appreciate is that you don't just describe these experiences as things that you can try, but you narrate your experience of each of the practices. Um, now, some you have more experience with than others, so there, there's a, a stronger narrative connection. But some of them, you know, it's practical on how that works, how you practice this. And but it's also like, what did these practices bring up for you? And um, how how wrestling with them helped you deal with other things that were going on in your life and when I, when i say this it's relationships ending sometimes um it is dealing with past histories with your family and uh, wrestling with grief and some real like life shaking moments and i appreciate the fact that this is a book about you being real with the practices. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's in in some respects it's a field guide to spiritual practice, but it's not just 
uh, a field guide that's just here's what this practice is. It, it's it's much more personal. Um, and I so I share my wounding story early on and uh, show how these par- practices have been part of that healing journey, salvation journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I even name at some point these practices have been part of my transformation healing journey. But if I don't share what I'm healing from, it it, it almost how how do people connect to it? And so I I'm rather specific in some of the the woundings in life, which probably have overlap with other people or at least some sufficiently similar connections for people. And uh, I think there's that notion that when you're specific, that allows for the universal to actually open up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. so I made a point to do that. And I, I, it's in a way a spiritual memoir, but it's, it's not quite that, but I, I do, I do self disclose and share as necessary along the way to help propel this Um and I, I, I think it's a helpful thing to help more people uh, appreciate these practices. And potentially, if they were to try these practices, it'll give them a, a, a strong starting point to, to have their own barometer, their own sense of, of their own experiences with them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've never experienced, how do you say it? I, uh, I, uh, I was that. School. <laughs> yeah. I was that. Uh-huh. Um, or cybacillin like that that's that's like beyond the realm of anything i've done so like you narrating your experience with it and i would say i think that integral to your experience with it was people walking alongside you through the process um to help you um make understand what you were experiencing but you also narrate spiritual disciplines or practices that i'm more familiar with but maybe haven't experienced in the same way. Um, I'm thinking of fasting. I mean, you, you've fasted for longer periods than I ever have, which is, you know, probably two days at the outset, but like the, what's going on in your, in your body as you're experiencing fasting and, and what that uh, entails and what the benefits are. And so I, I have really loved that. Um, And just cycling back when you you spent a, a, a long time in Boulder, and I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and so when we talk about uh, nature, I I could go outside and talk to just about anybody, and they will tell me that that's where they they experience transcendence. It's it's yep. true of my my spiritual but not religious friends. It's true of people in the church that if I ask them where do they feel God's presence, they're like, well, when I'm on a mountaintop. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. that is just you know part of the the DNA of this part of the world. Yeah. Um, and if we're not going to tap into that, we're missing out on on you know the the spirituality of the masses. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, and it is the case that there are people who live in less, uh, I don't know, geographically exotic, flamboyant kind of places. You know, you can live in the middle of the Midwest where it's more flat. Uh, you can live in a big city, Chicago, New York, and have uh, community parks and gardens. Mm-hmm. So there, are, there generally are places to go where you can uh, see a river, see a pond, uh, see birds, uh, listen to the rustling of the leaves and the wind of tr- the trees. Um, and, and it matters that we take the time to do those things. So, yes, mountaintops are a profound place to experience, but I- I'm hopeful that these practices can help people to experience God's presence in, in a plastic booth at McDonald's, too. It, it's, mm. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. yeah. It's, so nothing is God is everywhere, but if if our radars can become tuned, and and these practices basically help us tune our radars, and so if we can experience it on the mountaintop, well, how about in the foothills, and how about on the rolling hills, and how about on the plain, and and how about in the parking lot at Walmart, and you mm-hmm. know, and how about in your own home with your family? So it, they're they're kind of if you can experience it here, you can experience it here also, and these all help us to be able to do that. Mm. Yeah. I've said before, uh, personally, 
that that spirituality is about attention and intention. The, so when I when I think about spiritual practices and some of the ones you name, uh, both of those are there. If you're going to practice something, you have an intent. Yeah. But it is also a lot about a lot of it is about paying attention. Um, and so if if thinking specifically about the nature practice, mm-hmm. um, when I was younger, if I went for a hike, the the goal was to get to the summit as fast as possible and and you know beat everybody that I'm hiking with. Uh, but uh, several years ago, I learned to to name the wildflowers and wildflowers. Some of them stand uh, like an inch tall. Uh, and if you aren't going to slow down and look, you will never see them. They yeah. will just, they will just look like grass. Um, and, and so it is about taking time to, to pay attention and appreciate. And you're right. I also, when I started to do that, you notice the, the flowers and the weeds that are growing through the cracks in the sidewalk as I walk through town. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it, you, you learn to attend in a different way. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. At- attention really is the, the, the primary uh, practice. And these are all various ways to practice being attentive, uh, either to yourself, to, an object or and or uh, the, the the beyond and I maybe all simultaneously um, and so no one of these practices is the best right one whatever is working for you well run with that and if you mm-hmm. want to try some other things sure try them but uh, the, the main thing is I, well centering prayer is kind of my default mainstay in sure. many words. Uh, and there's rhythms in my life. I'll sometimes I, I consider myself a binge centering prayer person. So I might not do it for two months and then I'll binge and do it for 30 minutes a day for, for two weeks in a row. Uh, or, or I'll have little times where I have five minute or eight minute experiences. Um, and they all matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's no, beating myself up if I'm in a period where it's been two months since I've done it. Well, okay. What, what am I doing? Oh, I'm doing this. Apparently that's meeting the need right now. Um, but what I try to avoid is just total deserts where I'm not doing anything. And, Oh, that's why I'm so grumpy and <laughs> uh, not pleasant right now. That's because I'm not doing anything <laughs> to tend to, to myself and to, to being communing with God. Mm-hmm. So th- when I those are the times to try to avoid. So practice requires some intentionality, as you mentioned before. Like okay, Lent gives us a forty day period where many people amp it up, mm-hmm. and then what happens? Do we just sort of coast until Pentecost, or I, what? What what do we yeah. do? Can we maintain some of what we've just done? This is yeah. where we have some opportunity. Yeah, yeah. There's the that line in in the Mad Farmers Liberation Front where Wendell Berry talks about practicing resurrection. And I I think that this season after Easter Sunday is a time to think about what, what that actually entails. Now I, I, there's too many practices for us to really speak in depth about any one of them (laughs) um, and have people listen to this podcast because you, your, your, your book deals with them you know, at length. Um, so I, I'm not going to do that. And I know that your goal is not to get people to do the practices in here that they are not comfortable with and don't have mm-hmm. uh, a, a category for. Like you're not hoping that a conservative evangelical decides that they're going to get really into astrology or mm-hmm. whatever. But you do open up a space for people to explore. So when you, when you talk about these more Christian ones, or, or I would should say the, the practices that come to us from the Abrahamic traditions, you are offering it 
to those who are spiritual but not religious is actually your organized religion has some good practices for you. Yeah. And I, th I think you're doing that on the other side for, for those of us who are in the church that, yeah, there are some practices that you can enter into. So let me just ask this. This is kind of a broad nebulous question. You can go wherever you want with it, but what are some practices uh, or, or what, what do you hope that people who are spiritual and not religious will discover? And wh what are some ways that those of us who are religious and maybe not spiritual should practice? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I'm going to avoid the word should. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'm sorry. With, we'll go with could. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fair. All right. So the spiritual but not religious folks that are wary of organized religion, especially feeling allergic to Christianity, a lot of them don't know about centering prayer. They don't know about Lectio Divina. And frankly, there's a lot of Christians who don't know about those things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very, very true. And, and, and there are some conservative lineages within Christianity that are suspicious of both Lectio Divina and uh, centering prayer. The things that are more mystic, that are more expansive and less defined, there, there's a certain way that people can feel scared about it because it's you're, you're coloring outside the lines now and it's we we can't exactly control you as you're being exposed to this and doing this um but it really is part of the christian history is is christian mysticism and communing with with our, our creator the desert fathers and mothers uh the the great insights um, from the monks and nuns uh great uh, non-cloistered people, Pilgrim's Progress and uh, Thomas a Kempis, uh, Imitation of Christ. There's there's mm -hmm. lots of ways for us to experience uh, the living Christ in our lives. And it's not just going to church on Sunday and maybe going to Bible study, and maybe singing in the choir. Well, those things are great, but they just give you a small scope a small range of what's so much bigger uh and so you can have a a full great christian life doing just those three things choir bible study and church sunday <laughs> morning worship but it's a shame in a way it, to not be, avail yourself to so much more that could allow for more depth more curiosity more healing more integration uh and people that are spiritual, not religious, learning about these practices. Oh, you mean you can do the Lectio Divina approach to things other than the Bible? You, you can do it with like a Rumi poem. You can do it with a, looking mm -hmm. at a piece of art. Like, oh, this is, oh, there's, there's potential here that, and they might even be doing some of this, but they don't have the tools and quite know how to go further with it. Well, there are tools and, the Lectio Divina approach really could help you as you listen to a piece of music or hear a poem, read a poem, uh, read a, a, a book of literature, uh, mm -hmm. or even just communing in nature. It can help you yeah. practice being in nature in a, in a more reverent, intentional kind of way instead of, because even the spiritual, not religious people that are loving nature as church, it's easy to, I talk about it as Griswolding from the National Lampoon Ameri uh, yeah, yeah. movie. Uh, yeah. What is it called? The National Vacation or something like that. Um, if you're just going through the motions and going seeing nature, but not really spending time with it, you're, you're missing so much that could be there. So b both sides could go deeper with their own practices. Uh, but you know, it's not like nature isn't part of the Christian practices. Uh, sure. Augustine and uh, Wesley and Luther and lots of great. Go, go back to the Psalms. I mean, you read yeah. the Psalms. It is uh, the the heavens declare the glory of God. It's 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 part of, you know, Christian. Well, and if we claim to follow Jesus it, in Luke, it says Jesus often went to the wilderness to pray. Well, mm -hmm. Guess what? If we want to follow Jesus, we might want to go to the wilderness to pray, you know, or or at least in your backyard. Or, yeah, yeah. 
Um, all right. So, and then on the other side, a lot of Christians in America have a, a form of Christianity that's very cerebral. Mm -hmm. I got to, you know, give intellectual assent to various truth claims. Um, and for some people, that sort of is it. Uh, but if you were living with such a person and you're in your family, in your relationship with them, how is that knowledge actually transforming their lives and helping them be more lovable and more loving? Are, are they embodying what they've given intellectual assent to? Uh, are they actually al allowing for feeling and emotion to show up in their life? Are they embracing and integrating feeling? Are they allowing that knowledge to be personal and experiential? And, and can you embrace? Are you able to embody uh, this, this knowledge you have of, of God and Jesus? So moving from the head to the heart and having a more embodied faith and these practices that the spiritual but not religious have can really be helpful, whether it's yoga or a static dance or grounding, earthing in nature. There's, there's so many possible things that can help us. Uh, and, and it makes me sad that there's a lot of Christians who sort of say the right things, believe the right things, but there's more healing and integration and, and more relatability that could show up as they interact with their family members. Right. If they were to avail themselves to a wider range of, of healing practices. Yeah. 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 And that, that's fascinating. And it's interesting because when I re you read the New Testament, the, the metaphors of spiritual life are embodied. Um, yeah. And yet it is possible to give an intellectual assent to what we believe about Jesus and about what the faith is without ever letting it into your body. Right. And, and it's our bodies, you know, we're, we're humans. We are, we are animals and animals have nervous systems that are either spun out around certain people or more dropped in and relaxed. And so can we become embody the kind of being that I think the new life, the new creation invites us to em embrace a, that new body, that new way. Can we really drop in and have a, a, a transformation where not just dogs and cats enjoy our presence, but other people in our lives, they can, ah, I feel ease around you. I, I, something was different about you now than before. This, this, mm. I like this version of you that's showing up. And we all yearn for that, I think, ultimately. And these practices can help us to move in that direction. Yeah, neat. So if you're okay, I want to just list what the practices are in your book. Because, you know, we've talked a lot to sure. a, a lot of them. But uh, just so that people know um the the things that you're exploring are centering prayer lecto divina the enneagram fasting dream work prayer journaling the building of a personal altar solitude yoga and yoga nidra labyrinths being in nature earthing slash grounding authentic relating circling shadow work, winnowing, ecstatic dance, kirtan singing, somatic portholing, reframing, astrology, tarot cards, oracle cards, breath work, alcohol, marijuana, ayahuasca. Psilocybin, yeah. Yeah, yeah, shamanism, psilocybin, and, and poetry. Um, so those, those are all practices you deal with. These are not exhaustive. I can think of things that I personally practice that are not on this list. Um, and you're, you weren't trying to be exhaustive, but these is ways that people have experience um, the divine or spirituality and, and, and ways that you personally have interacted with um, yeah. these practices. I, always ask at the end and it's kind of weird to do this when you have named so many practices already but i usually ask what is one practice 
that nurtures you for your work. And I'm going to ask that question anyway, knowing that you know, you've we've named a bunch, we've ex- we've explained a bunch. But what what is the thing that is your go to that nourishes your spirit for the work that you do as a pastor, a spiritual director, as an author, as a blogger, somebody who is a spokesperson and a speaker at events and stuff? What is the thing that nourishes your soul? Well, so there's a lot, but something that seems to happen rather a lot. And I, I might have touched on it a little in the nature discussion. I frequently walk four miles or so at a time. Um, I live near a a walking trail. And while I'm on the walks, it allows me to clear my head. I can appreciate sunsets or weather, hear the birds or the frogs, or maybe cold on my face, depending on the time of year. Um, and I often will have a, a camera with me and I'll capture a moment. And so there's a contemplative photography, mm-hmm. uh, like, Oh, how can I be with this moment? How can I capture that? Look at that. That's, that's something of note that that's, that's beauty. That's, there's something of awe there. And I, I commune with that awe for a moment. And then sometimes I'll, it, it, it inspires a little haiku, a little poem that I will create right about that po- that that photograph that I just took, and I seem to do that rather a lot. Uh, and I, in a way, it's kind of a gauge of of how I'm doing. If I'm doing that kind of thing, I don't know. Let's say four days a week. That's mm-hmm. a good sign that I'm probably in flow, and open, receptive, tapped in. Uh, and if I, if it's been a few weeks since I've, maybe I've gone on walks, but I haven't taken the, the time to have the awe moment or see the beauty and capture it and, and write the poem. That's probably telling me something that I'm in an mm-hmm. overthinking state and, and uh, too much in my head and not enough really availing myself so you can walk in nature and be oblivious <laughs> um, sure. or or you can be attentive and notice and so i guess that i would say the contemplative photography in nature and then the the poems that sort of arise from it th- that's something that is for me a gauge for how i'm doing in in life it seems to be a pretty good barometer for how things are with me yeah wow uh, yeah i that's beautiful. And uh, I, I have never done that as a regular practice, but, you know, part of the, when I th- think about the hiking and seeing the wildflowers stopping to take a picture and to, to experience it um, has been meaningful to me, but, but I can see how a regular rhythm of contemplative photography would, would, would feed your soul. Yeah. As we kind of land the plane here, so to speak, I, I want to ask where where can people get your book? That where would you want to send people? All right, so the new book, uh, "Discovering Fire," is currently only available on Amazon uh, in uh, paperback form, but you can get it on audio form either on Amazon or on Audible. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is still Amazon. <laughs> is Audible Am- I didn't even know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the challenge with the Audible, I, I think they are have a- allowed you to have a PDF that comes with an Audible where you get the appendices and the footnotes or mm-hmm. the endnotes. There's yeah. a lot of endnotes and I back up a lot of things that I say because it's rather deep stuff and I the scholarship matters and my sources matter. And if you just listen to it, you might miss a lot of those rich material. So I, th- I think even on Audible now, I think there's a PDF that people can get as part of that purchase where they can access those things. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can order it from your local public library. And I love the idea of people 
uh, ordering these books from their uh, Kissing Fish or Discovering Fire at their public library. And that gets it on the uh, the radar of the library systems to like, oh, maybe we should carry this. Enough people are asking about this. And so I, I don't, it's not a money maker for me. I don't need everybody to buy these books. It's not why I, I write. I write to, well, I feel called to it, basically. I feel like God's mm -hmm. right has me with a certain set of experiences in life and certain gifts and this is what i'm being nudged to do uh so it's not a, a financial thing so much as a invitation a calling to help stir the pot and and help the church grow and expand as best i can from what i know and, and who i am yeah you know, let me just say because i when, when you talk about the notes um I, those those were important for me as i read uh you know, when you get into plant medicine and you you uh, explore how John Wesley um, was into medicinal um, plants and and challenged kind of the medical profession of his day. I mean, that that part was fascinating to me, uh, but also just the exploring, you know, the different practices and how people have done it. You have a, a lot of material in in there and so that that does help for kind of maybe the cerebral side but but you know for for anyone who has questions um you, you, yeah absolutely um, so this isn't just roger making stuff up out of the blue there, there's yeah. I, i'm in a lineage of a lot of people who are pondering these things right now it just feels like a ripe moment in culture and there's a lot of research um a lot of it's our medical medical studies john hopkins university and so on and uh it, it helps to back these things that i'm saying up and you know, here's where, where you can go to learn more and uh it this is a i'm hoping people uh experience this book as a tool to help them grow personally but also help our society our culture change as well yeah neat so lastly, I, where can people connect with your work? I mean, you are online in various places, but where would you like to send people? Well, so the, an easy way to reach me is the Roger Woolsey author page on Facebook. I interact with folks there quite a lot. There's also the Kissing Fish uh, book Facebook page, which is the fan page for the first book, but it's mm -hmm. taken on a life of its own since that book came out. Yeah. Um, there's a Roger Woolsey dot com uh website and there's a way to directly send me an email from there so those are those are the things that come to mind as ways to connect uh, there's also the blog the holy kiss on patheos uh where blogs and articles and essays kind of show up yeah uh, little not quite as easy to interact there but uh a lot more of my written material is there yeah Oh, very, very nice. So thank you, Roger, for making time today. And uh, I, uh, I enjoyed your book a lot. And I hope that other people uh, get to experience the things that you have put together for us. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll include links to Roger Woolsey's places online in the show notes. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation. As always, if you like this podcast, don't forget to hit subscribe wherever it is that you listen to your podcast. And do leave us a review on Spotify or an Apple podcast. It does help people find this podcast. And until next time, keep practicing.